So it's that time of the year when they give out the Nobel Prizes and the press release has recently come out for the Nobel Prize in Physics. It's actually split into two parts. Half of it goes to Arthur Ashkin and the other half goes to Gerard Mourou and Donna Strickland. And each has an interesting personal aspect. Arthur Ashkin is actually the oldest person ever to win a Nobel Prize at 96. Whoa! Exactly, yeah, pretty impressive. And uh, Donna Strickland is somewhat depressingly only the third woman ever to share the Nobel Prize, the first in 55 years. And the other interesting thing is that the work that she won the prize for, she won when she was a PhD student. So this is her, uh, Gerard Moreau was her supervisor and this was work she was doing as a PhD student. And traditionally PhD students have sort of been excluded from the Nobel Prize. Famously, Jocelyn Bell Burnell didn't get the Nobel Prize for the work that she did as a PhD student, but her supervisor did, for example. Uh, clearly the Nobel Prize Committee is moving with the times a bit. So there's two applications of laser physics that they got the prizes for. Fortunately, it's sufficient laser physics that even an astronomer can kind of understand it, and actually it's really neat. We start with Arthur Ashkin. He won it for the optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. So he invented the thing called optical tweezers, so he discovered a way of using a laser as a pair of incredibly sensitive tweezers. Does that mean the light can pick things up? It can hold them very, very carefully, very, very delicately, and can feel any kind of tug. So it's a very, like a very sensitive way of measuring when things are being pulled, for example. Um, and it's a, it, it's a really clever piece of physics that he used to do that. What he was doing is he would take a laser beam and take a very small glass or plastic sphere, not that much larger than the wavelengths of light, and put it in the laser beam. And it turns out that a little plastic sphere or glass sphere will stay in the laser beam when you place it there. And the physics is quite neat for that, so let me show you the picture of what's going on. So here's a laser beam, and the only thing you really need to know about this laser beam is that it's brighter in the middle, more intense in the middle, and then gets fainter as you work your way out towards the edges of the beam. A thing called a Gaussian beam, it just basically means it's brightest in the middle. And here's our little sphere, and the dotted line here shows the midline, so this little sphere has kind of been displaced upwards a bit. And you can see that what happens as the laser light interacts with this little fairly transparent sphere as it goes through it, but it gets refracted. And we've actually talked about this when we did the physics of rainbows and those kinds of things, where we talked about light going through uh, liquid drops in that case. But it's the same story, it's just basically the, the little sphere has a different refractive index, so that bends the light as it goes through. This bit of the light gets bent upwards, and the bit that goes the other side gets bent downwards. But because the light was more intense towards the middle of the beam, more of the light gets bent upwards and gets bent downwards. Light carries momentum with it, and that means the momentum of the light going upwards is more than the momentum of the light going downwards. In other words, there's a net momentum upwards for the light, but momentum has to be conserved, so if the light's acquiring momentum upwards, that means the little glass sphere has to be acquiring momentum downwards, so that pushes it back towards the middle of the beam. Conversely, if it had been displaced in the other direction, exactly the opposite occurs. More light gets bent downwards against bent upwards. That means there's more momentum on the light going downwards. That means that the little sphere has to acquire momentum upwards. So the net effect of this is that the, the little sphere always moves back towards the middle of the beam if it starts to drift away. There's a net kind of restoring force. And in that case, it's very like a little a spring balance. You know, if you pull it, the spring will tug you back to where you started. And if you squeeze it, then it'll push you back. It's the same story, and you can use this in exactly the same way as you use a spring balance to measure forces. You can actually see how, if you apply a force to that little sphere, how far it gets displaced until those forces balance out. Does that mean you can only use these tweezers with objects that refract light? So the neat thing then that Ashkin and his collaborators went on to do is you can actually glue the end of a molecule to one of these little spheres. So he did experiments with things like DNA to find out how stretchy it is by essentially gluing one end of it to one of these spheres and seeing how much the, the little sphere was tugged by the DNA. So you use the sphere just as something that you would attach something else to. Now there's one further subtlety in this, which is, as we said, the light carries momentum. Some of that light gets refracted, but some of it actually gets absorbed by the sphere, that means that there's a transfer of momentum from the light to the sphere, so there's a tendency for the sphere to get pushed along the beam. And of course what we want here is the little sphere to stay in the same place, so we can do experiments with it. So you need somehow to stop the sphere moving along the, the beam. The very early experiments, they found a very simple way of stopping the, the sphere moving along the beam, which is that if you do the experiment this way up, then the, the light's trying to push the sphere up, and gravity's trying to pull the sphere down, and so that actually you can choose the brightness of your light to exactly balance it there. Now it turns out that doesn't work particularly well because the thing's a bit unstable and it'll tend to go drift one way or the other. And so what Ashkin discovered was a much subtler way of doing the same thing. Instead of having the light just as a parallel beam, as we were showing before, what he actually did was got a very strong lens, so like a microscope lens, that means that the light is in a very convergent beam. So the light's actually converging on the sphere. And then you can see again, the light still gets refracted as it comes through and comes out the other side. But you can see that the light going out is traveling more along the beam 
than the light that was coming in. The light was coming in was, was at a steeper angle. So again, the light coming out actually has more momentum in this direction than the light coming in, because the light coming in wasn't really traveling in that direction so much. Again, that means there's been a change of momentum, that there is now more momentum for the light traveling along the beam. Momentum has to be conserved. That means that sort of net transfer of momentum pushes the sphere back in the opposite direction. So you use the two properties of the light, the refraction and that conservation of momentum there, which tends to pull the sphere back towards the lens here, and the light kind of being absorbed by the sphere trying to push it along. Those two effects balance each other out, and again, the sphere will stay in a fixed point. If the light isn't hitting or interacting or physically touching the sphere, how is the message getting to the sphere? Hey, sphere, you've got to follow the rules here. Make sure you move this way or that way. How are the, how are the two communicating? I mean, but it clearly is interacting with the sphere, right? Because actually, somehow the light comes in in one direction and comes out in another direction. And so for whatever the process of interaction between that electromagnetic wave and the sphere actually is, and in detail it's immensely complicated, it has to have been interacting for it to have actually changed its direction. And so in order for momentum to be conserved in the universe, that means that the sphere needs to be pushed back in the opposite direction. So there is, there is a, when light hits it, there is like a physical react like a, a physical collision there is a physical yeah exactly i mean you know there's this idea of creating solar sails where you actually have a large light gathering sail which absorbs sunlight and that will push the sail along so this is exactly the same thing that that interaction with the sphere is pushing it around is this nobel prize a triumph of like an incredible idea or what seems like it may have been some very very good experiment making like it seems like it would have been very hard to engineer and make this. I think it's both actually. It was, you know, it was a brilliant idea and somebody actually had the technical skills to make it work and to think out through all these details as to how to, you know, make it not travel along the beam, make it not move backwards and forwards um, and just set the whole system up. So it's a combination of a very clever idea and then actually having the technical skills to make it work as well. With the name tweezers, I get the impression this is like a useful tool. Who uses these tweezers? All sorts of people. So Ashkin's original work was in biology, but actually I have a, a, a much more recent example. So people are actually using these optical tweezers to try and see whether Newton's laws of gravity are actually modified on very small scales. It's traditionally very hard to do gravity experiments on very small scales because gravity is a very weak force and if you're doing things on very small scales, kind of by definition you have quite small masses in order to get them that close together, which means the effects are pretty small. These tweezers are so incredibly sensitive that they can actually measure these gravitational effects of the, in this case, what you do is you create a little cantilever here, so just a little diving platform, and then a little sphere here, and you can measure the gravitational interaction between these two things and see as you move this little sphere around by just moving the laser beam around, see how the force of gravity changes as you move the sphere closer and further away from the cantilever to see if Newton's laws are actually obeyed or if there's extra physics that we need to introduce. Either reassuringly or depressingly, depending on your perspective, it looks like there isn't any, or at least at the sensitivity they have been able to do these measurements. But this is the first time people have really been studying gravity on these incredibly tiny scales. Okay, he can keep his Nobel Prize. <laughs> You're too kind. Yeah. So that's one half. So then the other half is Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland for their method of generating high intensity, ultra short optical pulses. So this is taking laser light and making very, very intense, very short pulses of light, which turns out to be a non-trivial thing to do because so there are lots of ways that we have to amplify light. It turns out if you take, say, a, a very short pulse of laser light and you feed it into an amplifier, you can make a brighter pulse of light. If you start with a very bright pulse of light, which is what you want if you want an extremely bright pulse of light when it's come out on the other side of the amplifier, and you just put it into an amplifier, you melt the amplifier. Because there's so much intensity of that light already as it goes in that it's just too much for an amplifier to handle. So there's kind of a fundamental limit as to how much you can amplify light in using a conventional amplifier in that conventional way. So what they did, so I need to reintroduce again another piece of physics that we've talked about in the past. If you want to make a short pulse of light, you actually need to add together a whole bunch of different wavelengths of light. This isn't a single wavelength of light, even though it looks like it is, because you can kind of see a single wave there. The only thing that's really a single wavelength is a sine wave, and this clearly isn't a sine wave. To make something like this, you have to add together a whole bunch of sine waves of slightly different frequencies. And the shorter the pulse of the light is, the more the range of frequencies you have to add together. So a short pulse of light actually contains light of lots of different wavelengths, lots of different colors. So, and that was the fact that they exploited in order to actually amplify a very short pulse of light in a very clever way. Here it is schematically. Here's our initial pulse of light and we know we can't feed that straight into our amplifier because it will melt the amplifier. So what they did is they feed it into a device that kind of spreads those 
different colors out in time. The red light gets to the front and the blue light gets to the back. So basically you just have a system of gratings or something which as you pass the light through, the red light gets through first and the blue light gets through last. So now we spread the pulse out in time. Then you feed that into the amplifier. And of course, none of it's particularly bright at this point because we spread all that energy out. And so we can amplify that without melting our amplifier. Then you feed it into a gizmo which just reverses that spreading out. So we put everything back together again and you end up with a whacking great bright pulse of light. It's so elegant, it's really brilliant. Why do you have to have this pulse, break the pulse apart and then put it back together? Why not put in the constituent parts in the first place? Because actually the easiest part of making those constituent parts is by starting with a smaller pulse and splitting it up. You're right, in principle you could create each separately but it would be incredibly fiddly to do. Whereas here it's kind of, you're automatically getting things in the right combination because you know it's, it combines to create a single little pulse. And you, so you know by the end of it, it's gonna to combine to create one wacky big pulse. This is a piece of technology that actually quite a lot of people have encountered. If you've ever had corrective laser eye surgery, the strength of their lasers they're using to vaporize bits of your cornea, the way they can actually make the pulses strong enough to do that is because it uses this technology. The thing that splits them apart, was that like an awesome piece of technology or was it just the notion of splitting it apart that was the clever idea? It was the notion. I don't think, you know, the, 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 the frequency splitter and frequency combiners existed before. They were just the people who thought, if we do this, we can solve a problem. So they just took sort of more or less off the shelf things and put them together in a way that no one had thought to put them together before. Oh, that gives hope for people like me that I could win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, just go through your cupboards and see if there's anything there you can stick together to make something that no one's thought of before. Yeah. Unfortunately, of all the many ways of sticking things together, you know, 99.999% of them are complete rubbish. And it's only once in a while you hit one of these genius ideas. You happy with these this year's Nobel Prizes? I mean, you would have preferred an astronomer. Oh, no, actually, I, you know, I, what I really like, firstly, they went to interesting people this year. That's a good thing. Both of these ideas are so neat. I just, it's one of those things, the fact that you can explain them in a five minute video and really, you know, understand what the physics was. The fact that you come away from it thinking, well, I could have thought of that. Those, to my mind, are the best kind of discoveries because, yes, anyone could have thought of that, but nobody did until these people came along and were able to make that leap of doing something completely different. And that's why I really like this kind of prize, that it's so simple, but so because of that, it's so elegant. Five minute video. <laughs> <laughs> you will edit it down. <laughs> Hi, thanks for watching. Do check out the video about the 2018 Chemistry Nobel Prize over on our sister channel, Periodic Videos. Or you can watch past videos about Nobel Prizes. We've done lots of them over the years. There's a playlist and I'll include a link on the screen and down in the video description.